You are listening to the Food Means Business Podcast, which features the personal stories and secret ingredients behind what it's like to abandon your day job to start a CPG food and beverage business. I'm Janaba Johnson-Jones, former marketing executive turned entrepreneur and founder of food business incubator Hudson Kitchen. Join our community of fellow food business owners and subject matter experts to learn and laugh with us as we explore a startup world that's a little more culinary and a lot less corporate these days. Hi, Crystal. Welcome to the Food Means Business Podcast. We're so happy you're here. Hi, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I would love to learn about your company, but first I, I want to hear about your trajectory. Um, tell us how you made the leap from corporate to entrepreneurship. Yeah, so I've had a pretty varied career in corporate life before starting Full Cut. I was most recently working in fashion, mostly marketing, strategy, partnerships work. And I think like a lot of people in the corporate world was ready to move on. And having grown up in my dad's business, owning and operating a business is always in the back of my mind. And there are certainly many things I didn't enjoy about working at a big corporation, which you could probably... <laughs> So I agree with, um, you know, especially as you start to rise in the ranks and become more senior in an organization, you really start to see things differently. You know, a lot of times it's not merit based and it's more about how well you're able to navigate internal politics. And and I could go on and on about all those <laughs> things. Um, so so, yeah, I, I was ready to move on and again, always had in the back of my mind owning and operating business. And what really compelled me and what drew me to starting Bull Cut was a couple of things. One was trying to solve a problem. I have always been a healthy eater, but when I moved back to Los Angeles from New York, I was trying to help my dad make healthier choices. He has hypertension, pre-diabetic, all these health issues. And I noticed that a lot of these Asian sauces we were using had a ton of additives and sodium and sugar, and he needed to cut back on both sodium and sugar, but was using these sauces literally every day and every meal. And I couldn't believe there were no alternatives. I couldn't help him make the switch to better sauces and condiments. And because he was in the restaurant business, a chef, I grew up around food, I felt that we were in a really good position to adapt these family restaurant recipes um, into a new line of sauces that were um, more nutritious, better for you, lower in sodium and lower in sugar. Um, and, and then secondly, you know, another reason I wanted to leave the corporate life was wanting to do something that felt a bit more meaningful. And for me, what I saw growing up in my dad's restaurant was that food bridges cultures and food has the power to really drive empathy. And at the height of the pandemic, we were seeing this rise of violence against Asian Americans. And I felt that there was no better time than now to create a food brand that could change the perspective of Asian American culture and food and really can be that key to driving empathy and, and kind of bridging cultures. It, it's interesting because a lot of quote unquote ethnic foods are considered to be unhealthy in America, but we're really, they, they were kind of Americanized for the American palate. And that's why they might be a little bit more greasy than some other tradi more traditional foods. So. It's just really interesting. Yeah, and, and you're completely right. And what's so fascinating is I think people forget that East Asian cuisine and food, and particularly Chinese food, has been rooted in kind of this notion that food is medicine, right? right? So you look at traditional Chinese medicine, which has been practiced for thousands of years, and key parts of that practice is around nutrition and eating and herbal medicine. And that's really drives how we think about food and ingredients. But the recent commercialization of food, right, when you look at the origin and the evolution of Chinese food in America, it was about survival, which right. meant 
creating dishes and foods for the local palate. And that really changed a lot of things. But if you strip away the recent commercialization of the food and even sauces, right, it really is about nutrition and health at the end of the day. True. So how does your family feel about your food company? Considering that you grew up, you grew up a restaurant kid, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been really interesting on so many different levels because I think initially, like a lot of immigrants, didn't understand. They're like, "You go to college, yes. you got an MBA. Like there was a path for you that was supposed to be easier, right?" Right. And and when I decided to do this again, I think it was just shocking and a a little confusion, but since have really embraced it. And I think, especially in the early R&D days when we were going through recipe development, um, it's been really a full circle moment, right? Helping my dad in his restaurant as a kid and fast forward decades and he's in the kitchen helping me. And when we were launching, literally packing boxes with me and it's really been a special journey. So definitely initially, I think a lot of hesitance, but now they're just excited and involved, especially in, of course, the, the R&D and, and the development of flavors. That's great. And you, you actually had, had a place to go, I assume, to the family restaurant to do your R&D. So that, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to us about Bowl Cut. What is Bowl Cut? Bowl Cut is a new line of Asian American sauces uh, that's inspired by traditional flavors, but made for a new generation that wants to eat well. And, and how many flavors do you have? We currently have four SKUs. We have a chili crisp, a spicy version of that chili crisp, a char siu barbecue sauce, and a gochujang sauce. And they're all condiments, so you can cook with it. You don't have to. It's really easy and versatile. Put it on anything. You mentioned going through the R&D phase. What did you do next once you kind of got the product down? Yeah, it's, I mean, I probably chose the the worst time to start a food product. There were so many supply chain issues, like I'm sure you're aware of, and a lot of people experienced. So there were a ton of delays, and it was very hard to get certain ingredients. But when we honed in on what flavors we wanted to go to market with, it was really about perfecting them and making them in a way that we could commercialize and scale. Um, and, And that's really hard because flavor is so subjective. Um... Luckily, my chef is convinced that I'm a super taster, um, and so I can taste a lot of notes and Mm -hmm. a lot of nuance that I think the average person can't taste, which is great, but at the same time, I think I can be very specific about the journey of the flavor when, in reality, most people probably can't really taste the things that I'm tasting, but I think it was very challenging also trying to balance wanting to be respectful to traditional flavors uh, while also providing a new kind of Asian American perspective on things. And there's this, I think, constant conversation that we have internally about the consumer, right? It always starts with the consumer and what they need and want. And it goes beyond just flavor. So the format, the packaging, the use case, all of it. So let's talk about the packaging. So you have glass jars, right? Mm-hmm. So why did you choose glass jar, a glass jar over um, a plastic jar? A few different reasons. I think number one is it's definitely more sustainable, but that then means a lot of business implications because it's fragile. There's a lot of breakage. It's more expensive, all these things. And we also thought from a consumer perspective, it's easier to use than a um, plastic jar or plastic bottle. And I think it was sustainability reasons and from a consumer's perspective, better and easier to use. 
Got it. So let's talk about the the consumer. So who is who is your target audience? Oh, at first I have a question. Did you did you like obviously your parents were you know your family was like, deeply involved in the R and D, but did you did they you taste test it out with like other people in the community to see what they thought? So many people. I mean, I wanted to make sure that we represented a wide spectrum of people that would use the product. So we had people that were involved in the food space, chefs, people that worked in the food industry to taste it, all the way to people that don't really cook (laughs) and don't really know what to do with a sauce like this, but um, enjoy flavor and enjoy food. And so in those early days, I was literally like making these batches, dropping them off, sending them to people, anyone who could would be willing to taste and sending us the survey on and and filling out our survey of their thoughts. And that was that helped us really hone in on um, size of the packaging, what people cared about, what they didn't care about and which flavors we should focus on. Out of your survey, did did you make any changes to the recipe based on any feedback from people? Not exactly. I think one interesting thing was that we found out through the survey was that people don't really care about the color of Mm -hmm. the sauce. And that was really big because in a lot of Asian sauces, caramel color or red dye 40 is used because there's this assumption that it needs to look a certain way, it needs to be a certain color. But based on the people that we surveyed and talked to, they don't really care. Hmm. And that was that was helpful to know. I mean, obviously, we weren't going to be using any kind of additives or dyes or anything like that. But it was it was interesting. So since you're not using dyes, the the but the, the, the product is like a red color. How did you achieve that? So the spicy sauces are chili based. Mm-hmm. So naturally, with the the red chilies, they're getting that that color. And for the barbecue sauce, we're actually using beet juice organic beet juice. And it actually provides us a hint of sweetness. So we didn't necessarily use it for the color, Mm -hmm. but more so for the actual taste. Got it. Okay. So you, you surveyed the community and and, uh, consumers and what did you do next after that? How did you, how did you kind of launch yourself? So we, yeah, so we, we started with all these family recipes, made a ton of samples, got feedback from the community, and from there had to decide which flavors we wanted to go to market with. And it was really important that we launched with products that were easy to use and versatile because when you think about this kind of new generation of consumers, they likely grew up with a sriracha sauce, for example, and they understand how to use that and they use that across a lot of different types of dishes. It doesn't have to be specifically an Asian dish. And that's how we as a generation consume. So it was really important that it needed to be versatile and kind of easy to try, low risk in trying. And that's exactly what we did. We focused on condiments first for that reason. So it felt more approachable and lower risk in trying and you can really fall in love with the flavors and hopefully the brand when you try it. Let's talk about marketing. Talk about how you got the product out there to the masses. I think like any small business, you start small and we are an LA based company. And so targeted a lot of smaller stores and boutiques in the area. And I was really eager to also hear from consumers. So we've been doing quite a bit of demos and um, in-store activations to really understand what people are liking or disliking. And we're getting overwhelmingly positive feedback. I think what's really exciting is the flavors are so nostalgic that people are so excited and are filled with so much joy once they taste the flavors. And If you didn't grow up eating these flavors, there's still so much enthusiasm and excitement. I mean, there's just something about seeing um, a consumer taste your product for the first time that is so special and magical, and especially when they really enjoy it. So we, you know, launched D2C, but um, are actively trying to grow retail and have started kind of grassroots, small boutiques, small stores first get the feedback, understand what's working, not working, 
and then um, looking to grow from there. Uh, we'll be launching and just sort of nationwide later this year. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Um, That's amazing. Thanks. <laughs> and we have some other retailers that will be announcing soon. So it's all it's all happening. It's exciting. Oh, great. Is there any like, education for the consumer that just, some people just like not know what the product was? Like, and how did you handle that? Oh, absolutely. I think our barbecue sauce is exactly that. People love it and are obsessed when they try the product and taste it. And for those that grew up, knowing what a char siu barbecue sauce Mm -hmm. is they're so excited like wow this flavor is now ready to eat which doesn't exist and it it takes hours and hours to to make traditionally and for those that didn't grow up tasting it or eating it they there's definitely education involved i think it helps to know that it's a type of barbecue sauce and people know how to use Mm -hmm. that but the the actual flavor itself is so special it's sweet smoky savory it's so delicious on anything and yeah it it does require some education there i read that you did a collaboration with a fashion designer i'd love to hear more about how that came about and the execution of it yes we did a collaboration with a friend of mine who is a fashion designer ji wan choi i am obsessed with her work and i love how connected she is with her heritage and being kind of having this like hyphenated identity of being Korean American. And we've talked about collaborating for so long and we, it would just organically came up in a conversation how fun would it be to honor her mom and, and um, her love for food through this joint effort to make a sauce. And we want to expand beyond just Chinese Mm -hmm. American sauces and just kind of the perfect way to also do that to expand into other East Asian cuisine. So that was really fun and was something that just happened organically with a friend. And yeah, it's been, it's been really special to work on that together. It's really nice. The, the packaging is beautiful. So, and I, and I actually went to her website just to like look, look at her clothes and kind of, I kind of kind of saw how everything came together. So that was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She designed that. So we can't take <laughs> any credit there. So, um, you've been an entrepreneur for, I guess, almost three years now, right? I'm wondering, um, how you are taking care of yourself. What do you do for self care? That's a really good question. And I wish I had you know, <laughs> better, better things to share on that front. Um, I, I can't say I'm the best when it comes to balance and taking care of myself. I think having seen my dad open and operate a restaurant and literally did not take vacation for decades, I'm very bad at finding the balance there. I also am a new mom. So oh, congratulations. That's, thank you. It's been a lot to juggle, um, but I think the number one thing for me is being active. I mean, there's nothing like movement, doing something that that is active, that makes you happy. So I actually have an app called Steezy, and I take dance classes oh, on the nice. app. Oh, <laughs> nice. I didn't know about <laughs> and that. And I love it. <laughs> oh, if you love to dance or into it, I yeah. think they have just so many tutorials and classes, and there's short classes, long ones. You can take some for a few minutes. Um, So that's been really fun. And I've been putting my baby in the same room Mm -hmm. and he just laughs and has so much fun watching me be silly. What type of dance um, classes have you been taking? I like to do their, they have like a fitness dance one, um, ballet, hip hop. Those are, those are mostly the ones I do. That's really fun. So at Hudson Kitchen, we have what we call a money bell that we ring when someone's celebrating something. It could be that they're taking on a new retail partner or maybe their employee got their paycheck, whatever it is. I'm wondering what you're celebrating right now. Ooh, you know, I, I try to remember to practice gratefulness every day um, because it, it is such a hard business and it's really hard being an entrepreneur. So it's a perfect question because always trying to celebrate the little wins along the way. Um, I think one really big one is, I, I mentioned before that we're launching to Sir Latab um, in, the, in the fall. Mm-hmm. And 
I think the other kind of on the more personal side is my son just turned eight months and it's been a wild ride trying to balance everything. Um, you know, I didn't take, I only took a few weeks off uh, for my maternity leave and kind of jumped right back in. So it's amazing to see how much he's grown the past several months and exciting to, to see him crawling and um, babbling yeah. and getting his teeth. And yeah, I, I think just like the little milestones on the personal side have been really, really fun. That's nice. Helping kids definitely makes you prioritize everything. So, you, you know, you kind of only do the important things. So that's really good. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's made me a bit more efficient. How has um, entrepreneurship changed you? Wow, that's a really good question. I don't know that it has changed me. I think it's maybe sharpened like certain skills and perspectives I have on life. I think one 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 thing that we had mentioned was just like efficiency, right? So it helps to put into perspective like what things are important and what things aren't. And am I going to care about this thing that seems super stressful in the moment? Am I going to care about it in a few hours, in a few weeks, in a few months, in a few years? Um, and I think it brings... Yeah, a, a, a different perspective, but I don't know that it's necessarily changed me because, again, it's been I've been immersed in a business and entrepreneurship since I was so young. And to me, that kind of like stress and chaos has been, in a way, a constant, <laughs> <laughs> which is I don't know if that's good or bad. And so I'm kind of I'm used to that. And um, so I guess the short answer is I don't know that it's changed me. And maybe it's just brought things to perspective that I hadn't seen before um, and has showed me that there are certain things and skills that are so important that, and, and maybe it's because I'm a new mom mm -hmm. that I'm thinking about what are the like life skills that, that my child needs to have that aren't taught in school and not necessarily self-taught either. Um, and I think those are like key things that I learned growing up in a restaurant and being an entrepreneur. The, I think the, the two really big things would be one is figuring things out. I think that is a key factor of being an entrepreneur. Like no one is going to show you or tell you how to do things. Yep. You're going to get no's all the time and you need to have the resilience and tenacity and grit to figure it out if you hit a wall. I mean, you just have to. It's true because you're like presented with a set of information and you need to make a decision about that thing. You might be wrong a week from now, but right now it's the right decision and you have to feel confident in that and just kind of move mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and if it looks like there's no path forward, you have to find one right. and make one. And I think the other thing would be kind of having a bias for action. And I think this is very key to, again, growing up in a restaurant and working there at such an early age. When you see something, you just do it, right? Yeah. You know, when I would, the the trash is full and it's super busy. You know, I'm eight years old working at the restaurant. I mean, I'm literally going to do that thing. Right. Because who else am I going to ask for help? You know, dad's busy in the kitchen. Everyone's busy. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. And I think I've taken that with me in my life and it's so critical to just do it yeah no, no matter how small no matter how big like you just do it yeah that, that's great that's good thank you all right crystal thank you so much for being here um please let everyone know where they can find out about you and bowl cut oh yes thank you so much for having me i'm on instagram crystal underscore is my handle and you can find bowl cut at um, the bowl .com and at get bowl cut Great. Thank you. Thanks. The Food Means Business podcast was produced by Hudson Kitchen. It is recorded at the studio at Carney Point and mixed and edited by Wild Home Podcasting. Our theme song is by Damien DeSandes, and I'm your host, Janaba Johnson Jones. Follow Hudson Kitchen on Instagram at the Hudson Kitchen, and to get food business bites right in your inbox, 
sign up for our newsletter at thehudsonkitchen.com forward slash newsletter. Listen, follow, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. Until next time.